Hello, <laughs> welcome to tonight's talk uh, with Karol Rasiczewski and uh, Philip Kufler. Um, it's called Queer Ancestors and Reading the Archive, and it's uh, again part of our 70th uh, anniversary program of uh, the Summer Academy, um, which is called OK Oscar. Um, also, tomorrow there is an opening by Shulia Chang uh, in Trackner House, which you're happy, uh, happily invited to attend. And also, uh, there will be the open studios of the Summer Academy um, tomorrow and on Saturday. And uh, Karol is also part of the um, teaching staff this, uh, this year. He has a course called um, Portraits After Portrait. And um, also, your studio uh, visits will be uh, tomorrow and on Saturday. So I'm very happy that you even made it today, uh, tonight for this talk. And um, I'm going to introduce uh, the two of you. And then you're going to dive into archives and your practices a bit. Uh, so, Carol um, is uh, predominant, uh, like it's questioning the uh, predominant historical narratives uh, uh, of representation, and his uh, uh, archive based practice is, uh, is bringing together a lot of political, social, and cultural references and proving their, uh, their relation to the history of sexuality and construction of gender. Uh, his work has been presented at Kunsthalle Wien, uh, Msum in Ljubljana, White Chapel Gallery, and most recently also in Berlin at Between Bridges uh, at uh, Wolfgang Tillmann's Gallery. And um, after that, uh, he made a project for Summer Academy uh, in Trakli House, which dealt uh, with the um, biography of Trakli um, in a very loose sense, also referencing his relationship to uh, Wittgenstein. Since uh, 2005, uh, Carol has been the publisher and editor-in-chief of Dick Magazine, which we might also see tonight. I, th I see an issue lying here on the, on the table. <laughs> and he founded the Queer Archives Institute in 2015, um, which is also a, part, a huge part of his practice, and you're going to talk uh, about this tonight as well. Um, then Philip, uh, Philip Kufler studied at the Academy in uh, Munich and was uh, also a resident at the Atelier in uh, Amsterdam. His work uh, was uh, presented uh, most recently at uh, Haus der Kunst in München, um, Bundeskunsthalle Bonn, and also at the um, NS Dokumentationszentrum, which was a very interesting project. Um, his work uh, questions Western historiography in which heterosexuality and binary gender systems define social norms. And um, his practice is uh, a lot made up of silkscreen pin painting, printing um, on fabrics and mirrors, as well as artist books, performances, and video installations. And since uh, 2013, he's an active member of Forum Queer Queer's Archive in München, um, which is also a very interesting proje project of yours, which we probably will learn about a bit more tonight. So thank you for having this conversation tonight, and I'll give the word to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I think we, I, I don't think I know, we will start with our two presentations. Uh, Philip proposed that I will start since I'm a teacher, so some of my students saw part of this, but not all the people who are part of the academy, so I'm also very happy to share and introduce this work. It will be around 15 to 20 minutes, I hope more 15, and then Phil will present his practice and then we will try to talk, discuss, and later we will be happy to also catch your questions. And um, sometimes I'm talking too fast, so scream if I will just, <laughs> although my mood today it's really like going uh, up and down. <clears throat> but uh, let's start with, the, with this picture. It's me and my grandma. Uh, actually, I saw in the library of the Summer Academy that there is the DVD with this film when it's Fact Fighters Prologue. But uh, what I wanted to say uh, a bit of the background. So in 2005, I made the exhibition called Facts, Fagots in Poland, and it was considered the first openly gay exhibition in the history of country. So even if some queer artists exist, obviously in the past, they were never out. They were never presenting their works in that context openly. <clears throat> Slow. So, uh, so from this exhibition, many things kind of happened for the very first time. First 
gay Polish mural first, gay <laughs> Polish video, and so on and so on. So uh, this project that you see, Fact Fighters, was following the, the previous one, and it was concentrated more on me, my identity, my family, and so on. But also the same year, 2005, I started to run the magazine called Dig Fagazine that Max mentioned. And I actually have some copies with me, so you can take a look on them. The very new one just came out, and it's all about the queer history of Ukraine. And I collaborate on that with Anton Shebetko, and I'm very happy from the result. So, yeah, if you can, Hannah can help me <laughs> spread out this few issues so you can take a look. Mm. The magazine at the beginning, I had the idea to cover kind of the queer um, culture in Poland, but there was not much. So, very fast, I was trying to learn what is happening in the neighbors. That's how I get first time to Ukraine and then later to Belarus, Romania. And I started to traveling to whole Central Eastern Europe, gathering information and trying to really find out about what we have in the title, Queer Ancestors. And uh, while I was gathering these informations, I found uh, uh, Richard Kishel, who is still alive. He's one of the um, early gay activist in Poland, and many things from his arc have become a part of my practice. So he's like a very important figure, and I think in our conversation later, we I will get back to that, but I just briefly want to go through the, through the introduction so you see some images that I could refer in our talk. One of the things besides uh, doing one of the first, besides publishing one of the first gay zines in Poland, Ryszard Kiesiel also did something like you see, Polish Gay Guide on the European Socialist Countries, and it's 300 empty pages. He was working in a printing house, so he made this almost conceptual work. He was not an artist, he was just working in a printing house, but he made this uh, names of the cities and countries in the bloc, Eastern Bloc that he wanted to visit. Then he was traveling, collecting information, and taking photographs about cruising spots, about uh, uh, meeting places, saunas, toilets, restaurants, cafes, and so on. So it's a very unique part of the archive. The, another thing is his uh, big collection of slides that he created with his friends, also not really an artist. His boyfriend was a regular worker. There was some other guys who don't want to be mentioned from the names and surnames. And in 85, 86, they made this series of photographs that I was obsessed because they are also uh, very rare testimonies of AIDS crisis uh, in Poland that were not represented in any uh, uh, artworks uh, at that time. So many uh, things and works that I'm doing is actually referring to his archive. It's like a big base for me. It's one of the examples of how I work, like quoting some stuff from his archive and referring to um, also trying to find this West-East relation. This work obviously referred to general idea, but the, the stickers and the images coming from the Kishel's archive. I don't want to go like with details with the project, just briefly show you some references so you get the idea. But all these travels, uh, materials for the, my magazine, interviews, photographs, research that I was doing, I decided to kind of summarize and keep it under the umbrella of the in para institution that I call Queer Archives Institute. It's not really an institution, but it's rather like an art project that I'm running since 2015. But the first exhibition was uh, open in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, because the this is also, I think, we can talk later, but I was thinking how to call this kind of institution, if it should be like a Polish archive, Eastern European archive. But then I thought if I would be American, it would be just global. So Queer Archive Institute, but the idea is that I'm not covering North America and Western Europe. <laughs> so that's why the Sao Paulo was actually quite interesting place to start with this exhibition and to juxtaposing materials from the collection, both from my friends and collectors in Brazil and uh, in Eastern Europe. Then the kind of um, exhibition projects uh, related to the activities of the Queer Archive Institute. We're traveling all over Europe, uh, but it was always the idea to kind of 
mixing things. So in Kyiv, when I was presenting first time, the whole exhibition was dedicated to actually Belarus. And then uh, in other countries it was mixed and so on. So to kind of also put the question that we also could discuss about the queer geography. We talk centralized in Europe, but how it's perceived from the queer perspective and from the queer past. Sometimes the Queer Archive Institute take the shape of the performance. Here I'm in drag occupying the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb and um, kind of running the office with interventions, like explaining what is wrong with this museum and the program and the collection. And it's the, the, the spot was kind of hided, but still accessible from the main rooms of the museum. And this um, trick with the big logo, it's always working because whenever you put the nice big logo, people think, oh, it's an institution, they don't want to disturb and so on. And then the whole discussion is kind of starting. Um, also, the, the idea of just to having this kind of institution was so um, successful in a way because so there were some places that I couldn't even travel, like Colombia. And my friend with the group of other friends, they created the Cuyacaf Institute uh, exhibition in Bogota, doing their own research, presenting their own uh, interpretation of archives, their own kind of stuff, but also in, pro in inviting guest performers, as you could see here and some other materials with a bit of uh, materials from Central Eastern Europe. So it's always kind of a juxtaposition of this uh, narrations and all these um, stories. Uh, also, which is very interesting and happened to me a lot, maybe also we can talk about it, when I'm traveling, uh, many activists, in, especially in the post-Soviet countries, telling me that they are fighting each other. Even if there is just a little people and small institutions, they are fighting with each other. Also competing for money from the West. So when I come in, they treat me not as an artist, but as a, but as a foreigner journalist, and suddenly everybody wants to talk with me to tell what is really truth and what really express the real queer life in this particular country. So sometimes it's helping to really... Uh, get attention from the whole community and build something that was not possible before. Sometimes it's more educational, uh, sometimes it's the, sh the exhibition takes shape of the workshop, of the um, room where we have the classes or some presentations. This is exhibition from uh, Schulis Museum uh, in Berlin. I think we also going to talk about the idea of the queer gay museums in the world and how it works and why and so on. Uh, but it's interesting to say that when I did this show in 2019 in Berlin, they said that it was the first time that they were presenting Eastern European art in this place. Then there was the shows in Slovenia, Ljubljana. They also said that it's the first kind of queer show in this huge museum because they were this is also another interesting topic. They were pretending that contemporary art is so post-post that everything is universal, so it doesn't make sense to make a queer show, but at the end, it never happened. So it's also the paradox that we discuss with my students. Uh, and this is the show that, uh, this is the show um, that I did in Warsaw several years ago. Uh, also, I invited some other artists to participate in that, but um, it was a kind of retrospective, and now, slowly going to the end of this presentation, kind of brief uh, view of my practice, I want to introduce to the paintings, actually, the portraits, because this is also the topic that I'm uh, trying to introduce at the Summer Academy. So on the top of the Queer Archive installation, you can see the... Uh, line of portraits called Pochet, which is translated as a gallery of portraits. And it's a kind of a first impulse, the reason that I actually get back to the painting, because uh, I was trained as a painter, but then for many years I focused on video installation, research and so on, and I thought it's really like uh, useful, useful uh, like uh, unuseful, the bourgeois medium that it's not really served to anyone, but through the social media, through the um, culture, in pop culture, I started to realize that people are actually love figurative paintings and uh, it's easier to seduce them with some stories and introduce some topics with the painting, but even much more, even if it's reproduction, through the posters, through the 
posts on the Instagram, Facebook, then through the videos or some works that are presented only in the gallery space. This is, was my idea from the beginning when I started the magazine. I also wanted to sh see and think how I could reach the other audience than just the art world. And par the paradox is that with the classic painting on the canvas, it happened that it was the most uh, seducing medium for, let's say, people from outside of the bubble. That was also kind of lesson for me. So I continue with that and uh, I play on many different levels with the concept of how the painting can be used. As you see, it's quite bright colors, quite based on the drawing. And um, here it's uh, another example of how it, it's like a basically this series is portraying this particular one because it continue later. Uh, the most prominent Polish figures from the culture, politics, you have Polish kings, writers, poets, and so on. And I also found it interesting how the appropriation of particular stories of the, or reappropriation re from the mainstream narration of national narration could bring them, can bring them back to the um, to the audience, to the students, and to the different people who could really use them, let's say. Because for, uh, I'm saying that as an activist, I think what I could really do is influence what will be in the books in the future. So through these portraits, and always there is a story behind the portrait, it's kind of helping me to spread out queer propaganda, which is also important in the rising right-wing nationalist movement in Poland. The other idea of portraying and continue kind of the archive, we, I think we also can get back to that, because I'm going really briefly, is to introduce the voices of those who are not presented in the archive. So what I found out after years of working on the research in Central Eastern Europe uh, on the communist times, that predominant narration is not even narration, but the artifacts are coming from uh, Tsi's gay man, and those magazines are dedicated to those bodies, those stories, and so on. So for the video portraits and the interviews, I'm mostly focusing on um, female voices and transgender voices, because this is something that is not documented in the archive. And then when you're showing just the material, it looks like a completely different story. Those people are so invisible. And that's a part of the kind of responsibility and the way of thinking how the archive can continue and how can be uh, mm, reconstru reconstructed, let's say. And also the, the, those voices are from different places. This is Romana Bantic, a fashion designer and transgender activist from Croatia. And um, yeah, so those, for, those portraits, let's say, or rather oral histories documented through the video interviews as a part of the Queer Archive Institute um, practice and they are accessible online so you can check them also. Uh, just one example on, on the very end of how I work and how the archives uh, serving me. It's uh, Eva Houshka. She was one of the leading figures of the Solidarity Movement. Maybe some of you heard about it. So it was the movement, political movement that uh, helped to end communism in Poland and basically in Europe. And um, she was a leading figure, but in 2000, she, after her full transition, she started to be erased from the Polish history. Literally, uh, some books, some, some politicians started to saying that she never exists. So uh, what I do, I record a few hours interview with her when she's literally telling the whole story, but also telling about her plans and so on. It happened that she was born in the same town as I was born, in Białystok, northeast part of Poland. And I created a quite big, as you see, image of her kind of referring to the 80s style, to the posters of Solidarity Time, and uh, replacing the figure, male f dominant figures that were always present there with her uh, image. And, yeah, sorry. And the last picture that I want to show, it's a painting, quite big, it's more than one meter and a half, uh, called Detention of Margot. Because uh, I'm constantly obsessed with traveling, with gathering information, history, stories, rewriting, researching, documenting. But then Poland is screaming because po we have really super fucked up government for, for a long time. And uh, repression against... Um, queer community, LGBT community were really heavy, especially for 
for younger people. So, uh, but there was also resistance. And uh, two, three years ago, there was uh, the biggest action. Actually, it was probably the biggest police violence against the queer community in the whole European Union ever. Uh, for purpose, they were so. So, so the the Margot, the non-binary activist, um, was detained, and the people wanted to protect her. So there was a peaceful manifestation of artists, DJ activists, and it was very violently bashed by the police. So many of my friends were for 24 hours in jail, and it was a lot of repressions. So. I thought like, okay, Carl, you work with the history, you're documenting the past, but who, who really will be documenting what is happening now? And of course you have a lot of press and media clips and like everything is kind of online, but then this old fashioned medium of painting, this kind of also, of course, playing with this big events like Guernica and so on. I thought like it's interesting to stop for a moment and decide to portray the contemporary events as it's already it's a part of the history to be actively creating this narration uh, by having the privilege of being visible in my country. So yeah, so maybe I will shut up here, <laughs> finished. But I just wanted to show you different images so you, when we will be talking, you have some uh, references. There is also a book of mine that you could take a look and circulate through the event. And now I'm passing the microphone to my dear friend, Philip. Thank you so much, Carl. Yeah, um, my name is Philip, and I'm. Um, I think one thing we actually also share together that I, I was actually also studying in in the art academy in Munich painting. So we also both have like a um, um, at actually like a painting art education, and then but during my studies, I was really like already getting involved, like researching a lot about queer history, about Magnus Hirschfeld, for example or about Paul Höcker, about whom I will talk a bit later on again. And in the beginning mainly, I was really much focusing on context around the United States and the UK. So for example, like channel idea or group material or act up were really like um, the people I was referring to a lot. And through their work, I knew a lot about um, the queer history of the United States in the U UK. And even I was born in Germany and lived at this point my whole life in Germany. I knew so little about the history of Germany as well. And this made me really like wonder like the modes of representation or how it's also sometimes for curators in Europe then also much easier to refer to the AIDS crisis, for example, in the United States to not look at like what happened actually in Europe, also like as a form of protection as well. So um, in the end of my studies, I was founding out about this uh, small um, queer archive. At this point, they were called Forum Homosexualität und Geschichte München e.V. Now we are called Forum Queeres Archiv München. And since 2013 now, I'm an active member there, and really um, it became a very big part of my own practice. But I'm also like very much involved like in the um, running daily like the archive, like I take care of their website and their social media. And I think like what I'm interested today is a bit like to look at like what is the role of an artist actually in an archive? What is the difference like from a normal historian who's entering the archive? What are perhaps like our interests are, um, also about topics which are so often also by queer historians being neglected? And so the first work was where you can see us still here, um, Projection on the Crisis, Gauwa Ladein in München. Um, about the, and I also give the books around when I talk about them, <laughs> um, which is really like um, telling the history of the peak of the AIDS crisis from 1980 to 1990 in Munich. Munich was actually like a city with a lot of queer history, but like um, a younger queer um, community didn't exist so much there when I was a student and there was really like, I don't know, like this generational gap as well. And I think this became actually 
the most of the members were in the 60s and 70s when I became a member of the archive. Um, so the archive was founded in 1999 and is supported by the city of Munich, but most of the work, like the rent is paid by the city and two mini archive archivists are paid like with 10 hours per week, but all the rest is voluntary done. And this is of course by, by no surprise because um, for so long the city and the state-run archive really neglected or ignored completely queer histories. And so there was really like within the community a uh, desire to describe our own histories. And this is of course very differently way of describing histories. It's not a perspective only like from the, from the, power, from the perspective of the powerful ones. It's really like much more like a perspective from the community itself, like a really different way of history writing. And this became so interested of me. And I think like besides this queer subject of the archive, the more interested I'm almost still like in the self-organized way of writing histories and like really like these different power structures who are involved in I think also not only like questions like the queers for me not only like the topic around sexuality and genders of the material we select it's very much also like what kind of materials we do select and so like um, when I became then um, a member I was as I said, starting to focus on the AIDS crisis and many of the politicians were still into power. Peter Gauweiler, who was the most awful one, um, was still actually in the German parliament. He was also like the, Parlam um, the Bundestagsabgeordnete um, parliament, uh, like, yeah, in the parliament sitting with the biggest side income as a lawyer. And this made me, of course, very transparent that he was really actively suing journalists who were writing about the AIDS crisis. So he was really have the possibility to control even the narrative. So yeah, these uh, questions around like representations and who's telling the histories um, made me start to make this video together with the artist book. Ah, so nice. <laughs> so here you can see um, one of the um, stills and there actually on the floor you see one of the first quilts I started to make then. It's the quilt about Hubert Fichte, a German um, ethnologist and a self-taught ethnologist and fiction writer. And so I started then this research about um, these portraits about people but are in this quilts, quilts is of course, for example, like with the AIDS memorial quilts, a tradition which was very present in the United States, especially at uh, um, um, during the AIDS crisis, but a tradition which existed already actually before where the clothes of the people who passed are being used to make something new out of them. And so for me, the selection, like my quilts are very different, of course, than the traditional uh, quilts you s can see in um, folk uh, art museums, for example. But the selection of the fabric is still up to date. So um, I started in the series in 2013, and so far there are, up, uh, there are 52 quilts I made. And um, this became almost like an index as well of my research and the things I was starting to get interested in. And I really tried to find like a new way of portraying these people. I think like these questions about around a portrait is, I think like during our um, friendship and our conversations we had the last year, we very often had the feeling or like that we see like, uh, certain things very similar, but then the, our artistic income or our artistic solutions to the problems perhaps are also in very many cases very differently. Like I really wanted to find like in this quilts like not iconic representation, where it's not only about like making a big portrait about someone, but really much more about the um, complexity and difficulties to approach these histories. This quilt is, for example, about Rabe Perplexum, a Munich-based performance artist who, from 1983, they refused to be, to be neither male nor female. They wanted to become a raven. The, Rabe is the um, um, German word for raven. And really complicated this um, 
representation of gender as well, very much in their practices as well. And so you can use actually all the um, pronouns for Dabe. There's a constant mixing in their own texts, um, how they describe themselves as well. But um, um, the Rabe's uh, um, um, estate, they died in 1996. Um, went to a city archive in Munich, but the city archive didn't have the capacity to digitalize or order the archive, so no artist or researcher was ever allowed to access like the estate. So for me, and it was of course like performance art, so like what is staying from performance art was of course in general very much connected to this question. So you see different boxes then, I asked for four years actually till I finally received for one day only like the access to the archive. And for me, for example, in this quilt, it was really like the questions, what is staying from the performance as well? And how you can tell the story of, about Raven, for example. Um, there was also then in connection to this like one video installation where I was able from some friends of Rabe to um, restaged one of the performances, but I only had like descriptions from different friends and they were dead in this moment already for 20 years. So like there were also very contradictionary descriptions of these performances. And so this was almost like the topic of the performance then as well, like these difficulties to bring the performances alive or how to remember an, an artist where there's no work existing anymore, or for me at least in this point, not accessible. And this is for example like another quilt, uh, which is also connected um, through my research about the beginning of the AIDS crisis in, in Germany. This one is about Lorenza Böttner, whom, might, whom some of you might know from the documentary six years ago, um, where for the first time since uh, Lorenza's death, there were a big amount of paintings of Lorenza exhibited again, and um, yeah, the selection of fabrics with the suits and on the right, then a really textile cl cloth, which is a bit like what's inside, like the sport shirts, and then on the left side, a really like satin kind of like gala outfit, where you, um, which you normally dress um, um, in a very glamorous moment. And so Lorenzo had all these three parts in it. And yeah, this was, for example, then the quilt I made about Lorenza, um, who lost her arms when in, at the age of eight. So she was painting with her mouth and her feet. And she, she had very big difficulties in Munich to be accepted within the queer scene because it was super separatistic at this moment as well. I think this is also something we can talk again later on about this needs of separatism, but and also, of course, like these exclusions, also um, functional diverse or people with migration background do have within the queer community as well. And then so most of the work during the lifetime was then only shot like in this um, outsider art exhibitions, which of course like also excluded, uh, include, um, produced certain exclusions as well from a no normal art market. And so, um, yeah, Lorenza, her mom, she died in 1994 in, uh, um, in Munich then, but her mom is still living in Munich. So as part of the archive, we were organizing a couple of oral history talks with the mother and each time very, um, many friends of Lorenza came and taught their stories about Lorenza. And this is, I think, like, then the complications when, like, around documenta, a lot of people said, like, oh, the rediscovery of Lorenza. But you don't have to rediscover these people. There are so many people in Munich, for example, who have such a vivid memory on Lorenza as well. You just have to talk, speak, start to um, speak with them. And I think this is, of course, like something with this, more intergenerational practice now in my work, which became so important to me because like most of the time we study and then we hang out with the people we study together and don't talk to people outside the academy or like which are perhaps because of their queerness or because of their female identity didn't have access as a professor in the art academy because like till the um, 90s, all professors in the Munich Art Academy were straight and white and um, male. 
So here you can see um, many of the quilts. On the left here, the one about Lorenza. Here is, for example, one about Magnus Hirschfeld as well. So when, since I continued the series, um, I, I found many things in the archive as well, much earlier than the 80s. A lot about, for example, like the, from the 1930s and the 1920s, there were, where there was actually in Germany a big queer art scene or queer scene in general already existing in Germany, but there is of course so little knowledge about it because homosexuality was criminalized till 1969 in Germany. So there is not, uh, uh, historians always say like um, the Nazi regime in Germany didn't end it for homosexuals and queer people in 1945. It actually continued till 1969. And so whenever I show the quilts, and as big as the series gets, it's really like about these interactions within the different works, which quilt to hang between each other, and the layering in the quilts with the transparency of the fabrics. And th yeah, this is one of the performances where I'm um, performed together with Johanna Gonshorek, many of like the um, books and publications um, published by the forum um, were printed on the costume. So they are actually like the, um, the silkscreen printed fabric became not so dis distant anymore. So they became really like kind of like to protect myself as well. One other project is about this one about like with the poster collection where I always invited different artists and hang the historical posters together with um, um, new commissioned artworks and posters by artist friends and queer researchers and activists. And you might um, discover Carol's poster there as well on the front um, fabric. And one portrait was then about, uh, inside there was a film portrait about Lana Kaiser, um, which my, some of you might know through her birth name, Dani Kübelberg, who was in the first season of Ch Deutschland sucht den Superstar, the um, German version of American Idol. And she died in 2018 in only the last weeks of her life. She was um, identifying as a woman and started to um, started the hormone therapy and all the media in Germany after her disappearance in 2018 continued to name her by her death name, uh, Daniel Kübelberg, and no one referred to her as Lana Kaiser. So in my video, she was very important to me in my teenage years, where TV played a big role in my life still, and yeah. Um, you can see the scene together with the video installation also here. But yeah, through the quilts, I see them still also as paintings. That's actually like, that was um, my practice as well. But then um, these, for example, uh, silkscreen prints on mirror gla mirrored glass um, are also for me very performative um, because you do still see yourself reflected in them. And so I think like the mirror works, for, for, for example, like one way to come back for me to painting as well. And then I show them very often like in group exhibition or in solo exhibitions where I'm very, um, like the work hanging opposite of them become of course also part of my works then as well. So there's also certain layering of the body in front of the, uh, of the mirror works, but also the works in the space. You see more mirror works here. And then, um, yeah, the last um, two years I started to experiment more with silkscreen printing and making like this very um, large scale silkscreen prints. This was 15 meters long installed outside in um, Bad Tölz. Um, it's called um, Vergänglichkeitswahn. And this is one of the most recent uh, works I finished this April for an exhibition in Amsterdam, which I curated as well, which is called Body Text, where questions around like representation, and um, it's referring to a painting by Elisa von Kupfer, a painter from the 1920s from Switzerland, who was part of the Lebensreform Bewegung. Um, and he made like this 25 meter painting, um, panorama painting where he painted himself 86 times naked. And in my version of it, it's also um, um, on 
transparent fabric, so the works behind the fabric became also part of my work. But like the, I restaged six of the figures myself, but all the other figures are only described through their outlines and text is going around the outlines. So you see a bit like um, more of this work there where actually the speech, a speech by Karl Heinrich Ulrichs in 1867, which is considered as the first coming out in the modern Western history uh, understanding of the word, um, became kind of like the starting point. He invented words for people with queer desire four years before the word homosexual was invented in 1864. Um, only then in 1868 the word homosexual was invented actually. And it, for him it was like a self-description, whereas the word homosexual was a word by a, um, uh, by a doctor by the, um, who described it for, people, uh, for other people as, an, um, as a medicalization and then soon later on a criminalization of queer bodies. So I think we sometimes use, still use these words and don't think so much about like the history of the words. And... Um, and that's why, like, yeah, these questions about um, how we describe our desire became very important to me. And you can see already, like, one of the works of the other artists I invited, um, Laureen Weyers, a, a feminist performance artist based in the Netherlands. Um, and th these are works from the 70s of her um, are installed behind it, and you can see a little bit like the layering, like there, like in the whole exhibition, which took place then there. And um, yeah, this is one more of the quilts, which is actually also connecting my um, research also with Carol about Paul Höcker, who was the first open queer professor in the Art Academy in Munich, was who was fired in 18. 98, so 100, more than 120 years ago, because of this Madonna painting where he painted um, supposedly a male sex worker with whom he had a relationship as the Mother Mary in the middle. And because of that, he was fired then from the Art Academy and moved to Capri. And um, Carol also made a painting recently about uh, Paul Höcker, so that's why I wanted to show the quilt about Paul Höcker. So it's not always necessary that, um, like when I made a quilt, I'm going to the next research or something. That's why I'm also having big problems in the term artistic research or something. And also the certain hype around archives. I think artists were always in archives, actually, and they always did research. And yeah. I think this is actually really interesting to me that for us, like the visual material from the archive, which is very often forgotten by historians, become then really like the starting point of our research. So this is actually a book about the quilts, which you also could um, still share. And then um, one last of the mo last exhibition, which just closed two weeks ago about... Um, which was a duo exhibition with the artist Cosi Piero. Um, in 2015 and 2017, I reopened her legendary bar by Cosi in Munich. It was one of the first queer bars in Munich where a lot of like Rainer Ferner Fassbinder became, but she was actually trained as an artist and we became very good friends the last nine years and she unfortunately died one month ago now um, during the duration of the exhibition. And here we still had, luckily, the chance still um, to show some of her works together with my works um, and have like really like our works exhibited together. And um, because she was then always referred as like a queer um, bar owner or something, but her artistic practice was actually very, um, she was represented at art fairs as well in the 80s, but um, yeah, the potentiality as a feminine, female single mother um, who was queer as well was so limited, of course, so her work was unfortunately forgotten the last 20 years, so we reopened her bar, but then um, with Richard, um, public universal friend, um, but then 
doing our friendship, I really rediscovered, now I used the word as well, but like really she gave me access finally to see her work as well. And so um, beginning of the year, we published this book about her practice. Um, yeah, it's still quite fresh, her death. And um, it really made me think about like this intergenerational aspect of her death very differently the last weeks as well. And how um, in, in the end of her life, she said a couple of times to me, you know about my life better than I do. <laughs> And there was also a certain moment of trust then, which was so beautiful. Um, the install, she couldn't join anymore, but we showed her photos then in the evening during the day we were installing. And this was also like, I don't know, it made me really like how our bodies are also like containing like the knowledge and that she's kind of like giving me this knowledge and that it's also in a certain way like my responsibility as well which i find very stressful as well <laughs> but then also like how to share it with other people now so um yeah there's also like this book about her work and um yeah i think i also stop here now <laughs> and yeah You mentioned, Philip, uh, that you started somehow the archives and this process of searching to rewrite kind of narration that it's always orientated on North America, mostly, like Stonewall riots and Rainbow and so on. I, I forgot to mention, but this kept me in... Uh, the reason I started to do that, because uh, I didn't mention, but what also is interesting and specific from my experience in this uh, Central Eastern Europe or, or so-called post-Soviet countries, that this uh, issue of queerness or rather homosexuality was always connected with the West. So there was a threat. And every time some country of the region wanted to join European Union, the church leaders, if it was Catholic or Orthodox, were always saying like, if you vote for European Union, the, Union, the Sodom will come. They will take your children, your, your brothers and fathers and so on. And uh, it's, it's always like Romania, Bulgaria, and I heard that in Poland. Mm, and even my mom, when I come out, uh, I come out quite late, then uh, she she couldn't refer, besides being Catholic uh, deeply in her heart, she couldn't also find any references uh, in a culture, history or anywhere. Maybe that's why I focus so much on this representation of the figures, because I have uh, this kind of uh, uh, pleasure and perversion in bringing very known Polish dominant figures and saying, oh, you know, but they were queer, have you know, she was a lesbian, and so on. And it's always kind of uh, distracting uh, when I'm talking publicly about it or when it's part of my workshops, especially with the older generation. So for me, it become a kind of agenda, like a really culture war that I'm fighting with the um, with the government, but also with different uh, levels of engagement of politicians and so on. I wanted to clarify, uh, yeah, even if, uh, as I mentioned, I'm coming from the northeast part of Poland, so not such a big town, but um, when there was a first Pride host there, people even there were saying, okay, maybe the homosexuality was present in Warsaw, in capital, but never in our in our town. So we have to protect our children. So from the West and Central Poland, this sodomy will not come. So it's constant kind of, um, it's repeating <laughs> all the time. Uh, yeah, but I wanted to ask you how do you feel about it now after some years of working with archives and this kind of initial, uh, initial impulse that you want to rewrite or take a different perspective on the queer history? Is anything changed or is anything changed for you in that sense? I think, yeah, I can very much um, relate to this as well. And of course, like there's always like desire to tell the history of like of, of a process or something or look how bad it was during the NS regime, for example, but now it's so much better. But if you kind of like look on the 1920s, for example, and how diverse the expressions of gender and sexuality were there already, like it's really 
visible that it was not 1945 and everything was good immediately, that this is a completely fantasy and that is, it's still an ongoing fight. And I think like, especially like in all Europe, um, far right and fascist movements um, becoming very powerful actually. I think we're actually very much in a moment again where, where it is so important to remember these histories because when we don't remember our histories ourselves, they will be just gone. And I think like they are also much more protected in self-organized archives, actually like your Queer Archive Institute, or I think also like in the forum, because people do really care. They do this archive work from an own desire. And when I was starting really like in the Art Academy in Munich to start to research in the archive, many of my professors were all male, almost all, um, and all straight besides one, um, they always told me like, why do you care about the 80s? This is something which is not, and about the AIDS crisis, it's not a problem anymore. But then actually when I was researching about, for example, the beginning of the AIDS crisis, I was really reflecting how much the, um, I'm born 1989, so of course like, I'm not a contemporary witness of this time, but I think it was still very much, much affecting my idea of my own queer identity. And through this archive work, I was very much starting to reflect actually, because there's this silence to not speak about it, how much like the stigmata around AIDS, for example, was still so present for me in my up upbringing. The only time I heard homosexuality was discussed in school during my teenage years, it was co in connection to the AIDS crisis, saying, don't be queer because then you get AIDS. This was really like the things which we, we were told. Um, and I'm almost I'm not that old. It's not <laughs> 40 years ago. It's only f uh, 20 years ago that I was in school and finished school. So I think like this importance, like for me, Many people thought in the beginning it's a very nostalgic desire I have to deal with these histories. But I think th these histories are still so much forming our present. And only if we understand like these m methods of representation, uh, we also learn perhaps like how we can tell something for future generations, of course, as well differently and um, yeah, not only make it more inclusive or something, really understand like this power of history writing. Yeah. Does it make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really, I always want to start or end with this because I think it's really typical way of thinking like, oh my God, everybody don't talk about archives, artists doing the research, reenactment and so on. But it's really not about this yellow papers and nostalgia, although I'm obsessed with old it's prints and zines, yes, but it's not about this nostalgia, but founding the reason why it's still working, maybe because I'm in Poland, I'm still based in Warsaw and I travel really more Central Eastern Europe than other places, although sharing this knowledge like here in the so-called West, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you got the point that it's 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 visible. I see it uh, very clearly how how it's influencing the mainstream. Because what I was just saying about the Sodom coming from the West, the arguments that the queers are just uh, let's keep them private. Not they didn't create any hist uh, culture, or art, or anything. When you bringing them the zines, the materials, like rewriting completely the idea of opposition in the 80s, in the communist time, and how you are saying, yeah, there were queer ancestors. There is a line. It's not something that came from the states. It's also changing the way the journalists, politicians, historians are addressing those issues. Also, this is very my personal experience, the slides that I briefly just show you from Richard Kishel, that amazing colorful pictures of a bunch of guys in the 80s who are not an artist and create the, the most um, queer and uh, vibrant uh, visual production from that time in Poland, they were never discovered by anyone. They were. It's, it's funny enough that in 2010, I believe, we have a big exhibition called Ars Homoerotica in the National Museum as a statement of the straight director who was politically engaged and wanted to make a statement that he will give the space for the 
uh, artist uh, for the for the queer art, mostly for the gay artist, and then the gay curator. He called Richard Kisha, the this activist, but only to ask him about some dates. They never thought, and this is my experience of most academics and historians, that they so much in the library, so much analyzing what was written and published, that they never had the idea to go three times to this activist to, to, to the moment that he will make a second coffee and think, ah, oh, you know. I have something like this under my bat, and it's like a 300 of color slides in a plastic bag that he's showing first time ever to the guy like me who is coming and is becoming friend with him. And suddenly, because he's not sure if it's not too embarrassing that it's showing some explicit images, it was just for fun, and suddenly I'm publishing, pre presenting, and academics start to write about it. So I never, I always fight with this uh, idea that it's just this nostal nostalgic gesture for being safe, working on a history. The other, when you were talking about the dates, uh, I also wanted to say that it's interesting enough that in Poland that it's now perceived as a very homophobic country, and it always was, but mostly because of the Catholic Church, the homosexual acts were decriminalized in 1932, and never criminalized again, even during the communist time. So, uh, because when we got the independence, the, the new government decided to not repeat the old codec, uh, law codex, yeah, it's the correct word. And then uh, it's also interesting because of that fact, the, the, of course there was strong homophobia, but uh, Poland have a different situation than many other countries in the region because like countries like Ukraine, Belarus, it was forbidden. You could go to jail if you found that you have a sex in a public space or you have any photograph or the letter, or any physical culture material that is related to your queerness. It was, it was a proof of crime. In Poland, at least it was not. So that's why the archives are more rich and still something to search for. Yeah, I just have to think about, like, for example, like the film you made as well about Natalie L. Like, America is not ready for this. And I think, like, very often, I think it's not only about, like, it's also very often the case, like, about that we know a lot what is happening in the metropoles, but then, for example, about queer life on the countryside, we also don't know so much. So I think, like, yeah, there's a lot of things we have to question, of course, like, and I think this is why I'm still involved in the archive, because in the beginning I understood as an archive is this closed identity, but then as when you become a member of an archive, the biggest question is actually always what is missing, and how, who can we invite, or where, who did we not spo spoke yet. And um, in the archive in Munich, in the Forum Queeres Archiv München, which I'm now researching for 10 years, there are a lot of research, uh, a lot of materials, not only from Germany, but also materials from places where the people traveled. So there was, a f for example, like a really huge exchange between the leather scene in Chicago and the leather scene in Munich. The leather scene in Munich was actually really, really big. And um, so like there was one, charter flight going every year from Chicago to, to Munich to visit this one bar, Ochsengarten. So I found a lot of material about the leather scene in Munich in the leather archive in um, Chicago and museum in Chicago. And, but there's of course like you still see the power of the iron curtain there. There's almost no materials from um, Eastern Europe or Russia Russia before 1990. So these are, of course, like the examples, and that's why, yeah, it was so nice that, I don't know when, but like four or five years ago, you came to Munich and introduced your re research as well, like to our members, but also like to a local queer art audience. And I think like, this is really like the desire actually like, and I think like this is something which will never be finished. <laughs> I think like this is not a work which like now we addressed everyone and we can <laughs> stop it or something. I think this will is a process. And I think this is at least like also so, as something like as we see it. And, um, but this is perhaps like one part, but like thing, I think then in one part is also like queer historians, very often focused then on figures from the past which were be, 
which we could describe in an emancipatory way, and then very complicated narrations of queer people from the past, uh, through that often neglected, because you want to have like a positive representation of queer people. And that's why, if, I don't know, like I became also, for example, like very interesting also to this show, to be seen queer lives, um, 19 to 1950 in, in the Enestoku Centrum, um, about, for example, the history of Ernst Röhm, who was like a gay fascist, um, who was part of the masculine homosexual, so to, so to say, um, compared to like Magnus Hirschfeld, who had a very trans-inclusive understanding of queerness. And I think it's also very important to, yeah, remember also these bad gays, because like, when you think about Haider here in Austria, um, um, the leader of the AfD in Germany of the fascist party is um, also le open lesbian. Pim Fortuyn was in the Netherlands already in the early 2000s. And we can also not, in a attempt to only show like emancipatory idea of queerness, forget these figures as well. And very often, Queer histories are also very complicated, and you, there are also very big contradictionaries in their lives, also like through circumstances connected to, the, to their homosexuality or queerness. And I think, yeah, I think this was something I learned and um, going deeper and deeper in the archive, yeah. Yeah, this is a bit something that I also wanted to mention. We not go forever, but we talk a bit more and then we open for the questions, so don't sleep. <laughs> and uh, just wanted to say that uh, it's interesting for me also to see this idea of the museums, also the new idea of the queer LGBT museums. So we have Schmuller's Museum, of course it was like a gay museum and it took a long time to diverse a bit more. Now it's a, a female, non-heteronormative woman as a director in shift a bit. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, for example, in Poland, there was a big desire that finally, probably the next year, will make happen that there will be LGBT museum with the space provided by the city, that it's an opposition to the government. And then, exactly what you were saying, the whole narration, it's completely outside of what we are interested in, what we are researching, because it's about not about the queer life that much, but about the LGBT movement. So there's a whole museum documenting the first parade, second parade, the flag, the uh, history of organization, then another organization. And I'm not saying it's bad, that it's interesting that when the, finally the kind of institution is happening, it's also a very specific purpose and let's say propaganda or the goals. And again, it's not bad or good, it's just like interesting to think about it. So I also, so I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about it, about the queer museums or this kind of institutions versus more like a amateur or artist practice or... Yeah, for, I have, first of all to say, like I have very big problems with, for example, like the rainbow flag because like it became such a symbol of capitalism to me these days now. And I think like actually like this mirror works of mine are also kind of like a persiflage of the not rainbow flag or something, like about like having millions of different kind of pigments I'm using to not have like this one sign which is then really like about identity politics in a very limiting sense. And I think that's also for me the problem about like the ideas of queer museums. First of all, as an artist, I'm not so interested in and we are in the archive in Munich, we don't have an own museum, so we always have to uh, collaborate with different institutions and through that we also reach different audiences hope, hopefully and I see the problem sometimes also as well with the Schwules Museum in Berlin only a certain cis white audience is being addressed in there and going there and um, even there did a lot of great things of being more inclusive the last years but that's the image of the institutions and I think um, to, if, if you go to different museums, you hopefully reach then really different audiences as well. So I think like there should be not one institutions, we have to queer all the museums. And then there's one thing which is really 
personally struck me the most, like museum is only then the biggest task, the definition of museum is really representation, to have like one um, iconic canon of representation narrated in this museum. So for me, the idea of queerness and museum is very contradictory, like almost like the queerness always have to fight the representation in the museum. And that's why I'm personally like, um, don't believe that this is the right form or something. Even like the Schwules Museum as an institution I completely um, um, respect and they're doing great work. And I think I also understand that in a lot of different places around the world, um, these initiatives have really good intentions or something, but I don't know if it's, if it's in the long run the right form of representation, yeah. Maybe we're open for the questions because I, I, the questions I would like you ask it's much more <laughs> insider somehow. So I would be happy to hear what you would be willing to hear from us, for me, for Philip, or both. If you have any questions or you are already too much insider. <laughs> Thank you very much both for your um, insightful presentations uh, of your, on one hand, work, but also on the way how you work with the archive. I would like to bring up, which I think came out already a little bit, the archive as a mode of, let's say, presence, but also the archive as a mode of future. Now, how we maybe counter read the archive, even in a science fictional way. So I would be interested if that matters in your practice. So where we're not just kind of bringing up histories. And I really liked what you said, Philip, that it is not about the rediscovery. Because to some extent, things are actually there. They just are in the kind of blind spot and not been seen. And this is, I mean, this whole project here is about the school of seeing. So, and what we see and what we don't. So I wonder how much do we see the future in these archives? Yeah, there's of course like a um, certain attention to the notion of queer futurity, which I do think it is very important to me. To come, for example, like back in Paul to Paul Höcker, like this professor in the Art Academy, I was so frustrated during my studies how heteronormative this history was. And then like in one book um, called 100 Jahre Schwulenbewegung, one of the first big exhibitions telling like queer history from Germany, um, I found one painting of Paul Höcker and found out that he was actually a professor in the same art academy and was fired because of his queerness from this art academy. And even like it sounds very naive, but this was a moment to find a certain way of solidarity. And I think this is for me when the archive is the most productive, when there is solidarity with people before us and perhaps like think about the notions of time also in a queer way, really queer futurity, to not think about like future, past and present as something disconnected from each other, but something as strongly influencing us. And perhaps, as I said, with the example with the AIDS crisis, most of the times, the things we don't speak about are influencing us the most. So, um, yeah, I think like this is something I'm still st struggling with. I think like how, what does this actually mean as well? And like this moment with Kosi's uh, death now became also one of those moments where I do see this differently as well. Uh, um, because like it is like these friendships as well very much. Um, it's not something disconnected from us. It's our own desire as well. But then I don't want to have it personalized in such a way that it's becoming depoliticized. So I think this is a bit like, I do find the solid try to find the solidarities, but then it's not only about me finding the solidarity. I think like future generations can also find a certain solidarity in the life of a 19th century painter, academic painter like Paul Höcker. <laughs> I think it's quite, I think this, this is for me then queer ancestry, like in the best or something, when we do find new ways of solidarity and building these gaps then also through that to the future, our possible future. I can just add that for School of Seeing, the queer eye and different 
idea of different perspective of seeing is crucial for the artists, for the for the researchers, and I think this is also what is kind of a mixing the future and the past and the archives that we trying to sh show examples how uh, we can completely differently look at the things from the past, for things who are now, and they are much more opening, I believe, the future for different interpretations. It's I, For me, it's uh, I could see it as a more freedom by showing the simple examples how we are misunderstanding the past. And uh, it happened to me many times that there were like a literal proofs of that kind of feelings. And at the end, people questioning more, which is always good because then you are not sure. The basic, basic example, again, to my <sighs> lovely Poland, uh, it's like you have museum of, for example, Karol Szymanowski, famous Polish composer, the next, the, the second after the uh, Frédéric Chopin. And he was always kind of out as gay in the 20s, 30s, when he was uh, uh, living, the, the beginning of 20th century. But his museum have is decorated all by the female portraits, even if it's aunt, mother, uh, sister, just to make an impression like we're not saying anything, but we are suggesting that predominantly the narration is about the straight people. And even on this very small scale, questioning gender, questioning sexuality, the archives help us to completely questioning what we, what and how we see the um, reality, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I think like every generation has to find new already like the, these histories as well and have a differently access and interest again as well. And I'd actually like having a little bit experience about teaching now and then perhaps like the uh, students are only like 10 years younger than me, but I do find already like a different approach they have to these histories as well. And I found this actually very interesting as well. So yes, yeah, something not complete or something and like um, and not only like there's not always process and like that we do have to fight to um, or like really complete like this idea of process as a continuity is really um, dangerous and then really depoliticizing us in our understanding of being in the world yeah few examples of this new approach to the history by the youngest generation you can see tomorrow at the open studios there will be a few oh sorry but it's already there. Uh, a few very nice examples of that so join us uh, from five maybe, maybe i can <laughs> maybe i can also follow up on on sophie's question a bit uh, because you were all, uh, all the time uh, mostly talking about uh, the like your work also being le as if a natural um, succession of the missing uh, documents or missing histories in in archive and, and I think uh, what is uh, actually interesting of about both your practices is that you're dealing in a different way and that this is also kind of a querying of the archive practice actually so so I would be also interested in uh, maybe if very briefly <laughs> as uh, as you wanted to um, you could also go into a a bit more about your different ways of approaching archives because quilting and also the um, idea of changing the portrait is not a natural way of uh, like interfering into the archive as many artists as you said before did already since the 90s and even before yeah i think like the biggest difference of course as well that i became part of an arc between the two of us with from an archival perspective is like that for me like i became a member of an already existing archive which existed 12 years before i became a member already and um or th th um, yeah th around 12 years let's say it like that and um but i was like the first artist who became a member there and um becoming really part and in the beginning many of the members of the archive there is uh, many of them are teachers or like they, we have one butcher or like very different professions as well so they're not the, the fewest of them are uh, professionally trained historians but still like as an artist in the beginning I, 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 um, most of the members were around their 60s and 70s uh, in the 60s or 70s 
the oldest member was 95 years old who had who was um, two times um, um, charged because of the paragraph 175 in the 50s and lost one of his jobs as well because he couldn't leave the country anymore because um, um, of paragraph 175. And so in the beginning there was really a bit a, a certain like skepticism. What does it mean? Or like then um, I specifically became then interested in like formal and aesthetic situations or like representations, which were not so much focused on before. So I think like this was then really like something that where I could then bring something where do I, I do have a certain profession. <laughs> I, can, I cannot deny. <laughs> um, and I could then bring something the, uh, to the archive back. And so it became like more like not like an exchange only in one direction, it became a back and forth ever since actually. And very much also like questions allowed around f friendships for example as well. But like discussions for example around queer were also very strongly um, discussed now. Like in Germany there was till 15 or 20 years ago such a separatism that even like gay and lesbian um, organizations rarely work together actually and there's such a st history of this separatism and of course like safe spaces especially for women I have such an importance as well but of, I, I faced a lot of I don't want to describe this only as like an easy path as well this is exchange um, I, I faced a lot of um, transphobia as well or like um, not understanding like the historic exclusions of trans visibility in in LGBTIQ history and um, there's a very certain generation also very protective against the word of queer for example as well. So it's not something only like, it's not something easy <laughs> that I can say for sure like these exchanges. We sometimes describe them then also in a very positive way as like oh our kind of like and Cozy for example became really like uh, um, grandmother figure almost to me as well but like there's a lot of fights as well as well but like I'm still um, in most cases luckily these fights are still productive and I think we can learn from each other still but yeah there's of course like also different experiences of violence as well which I of course also as we as a younger generation also have to understand then so yeah does this answer a bit the question yeah <laughs> Yeah, just briefly. The difference is the, what Philip mentioned, the context, like being Pola, in be, being still in Poland and struggling with what is happening, not only personally, but just seeing these things. Uh, when Philip is saying like, oh, the younger generation, and he is almost a decade younger than I, then I could be like a dinosaur, and then it's like, I was born in a communist time. One decade I was living in a communist Poland, which is true, and even if I'm saying that, I hardly believe that, although it's true. And this is giving you a specific perspective of how the communists falling down, how the capitalism is built, and all this repetitive experience of my generation when I'm traveling is very present. So maybe because of that, I also always afraid to go too sophisticated, too sophisticated with my work while, like Philip is doing. I adore his work, but I think, oh, I, I'm not allowed. I have to con constantly fight, addressing, bringing more information, history, everything be, have to be very communicate about the communication, even if the it's, art, it's artistic quality, it's important, but I have this kind of pressure and responsibility. And I feel this is a part of being uh, for, for long in that and being in that context, And but it also give me, is giving me back the energy to do that. I think I would be doing different art if I would be in Berlin for, for just being in Berlin then, yeah. Can you share a bit why you decided not to leave Poland then ex as well? Like I think like this was something I found very interesting as well, like to your, yeah, your persistence really like to also expand always like the Dick Fagger scene, but also like stay in Warsaw. Can you tell a bit about this decision more or is this too? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's like many people here were asking me, but I also, in one hand I understand that, and on the other hand I think like, 
Mm, it's a very specific question. We are living in a kind of bubble, artistic bubble, like obviously you are moving somewhere or going somewhere, but I was born in the smaller city, I moved to capital and that was kind of enough level of uh, progress to still be still alive. And then I try, but, but the truth is that I, the Poland is in the center of Europe, so the going east and west is kind of convenient and to really, like Wolfgang is still much like to say, like, Karol, you are the bridge, you have to stay. But he's been only once in Poland, so it's easy to say when you are in Berlin. But uh, the struggle is real, but also, as I said, the energy is real. Because you have a, you think, oh, maybe it's just the queer, it's becoming fashion, and so on, so on. And then you open the newspaper, somebody's calling you, a 16-year-old writing to you on Instagram from small cities, like, fuck, it's really, if, even if I'm going publicly to the red, you're saying openly, I don't afraid, fuck mm -hmm. you, and so on. It's doing a job for some people, and then still I'm still okay to do what I'm doing to feel safe enough to just be there and to mm. have a cheaper production, nice studio, a lot of friends, uh, atmosphere that I could create and travel. Yeah, but yeah, for me actually like to stay a member of the archive in Munich was actually a bit like the same decision as well. Because like, for example, like in Berlin, there is such a big queer alternative art scene as well. And in this point, like, when I became member of the archive in Munich in 2013, 10 years ago now, it wasn't existing actually. And I felt like so much a bigger need as well to continue, especially with this archive as well. Because like Bavaria is also like the most conservative part of Germany, you could say in, certain, in many ways. Um, for example, what is being taught to children as well, it's still an ongoing fight actually. And... Um, that Magnus Hirschfeld is, for example, also not in the history books in schools in Germany as well. So there, I stayed in Munich and living also in Amsterdam because I felt like there is actually so much still to do. And then probably in other cities like Berlin where there's so much bigger discussions about like um, in between the scene, I wouldn't feel like this necessity. But I have one more question. No, sorry. <laughs> but what... Um, why? Uh, because like this is something also I'm interested sometimes with my work, how it's perceived in Munich or in Germany and then outside of Germany. I'm also like, how do you feel your work is being perceived in Poland and what's the difference how it's being perceived, for example, when you shout it in Brazil or in United States or somewhere else? Can you describe this a bit? Because, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so in the United States, they think like uh, <laughs> they don't know where it's Poland, so that's the first thing. Then it's a gay thing, so it's like, oh, we did it. We have a lot of things like that, so we are not interested. And then what you can bring, and if you are young and sexy and so on. Then in Brazil, they ask me why you are so obsessed with history? Like, why you Europeans are so obsessed with archives and history? The, there is a current problems. There are problems on the streets. So this is another experience. Then in Eastern Europe, activists telling me like also don't talk about archive history we have to work we have to you know psychological help center volunteers and then the west people say oh so you are showing in the garage like ha have you been bitten like how it's to be in poland and so on and this kind of exotization of like i never been to poland but it's five hours by train yeah but i was in china and like thailand and this and this but oh it's interesting it have to be interesting so it's uh, very exotic and it's funny but i traveling all these places all together so it's giving me also different perspective because I think if I would be just in Poland and doing in Poland in Polish context, I would stuck in a feeling that I'm so brave and so new and bringing the new world. And this is kind of reality check when you travel different places. And that's on the basis kind of uh, enough to have a impulse that as an artist you have to constantly questioning also yourself and your practice. I changed a lot in my practice, I would say, in the last 15 years, but I don't think we have time to talk about it. <laughs> because everybody are probably a bit tired now. So if you have more questions, then feel free. If not, then... Hmm? Yeah. 
uh, for you, Philip, because I know, Carl, you made your own archive, but you kind of chose to be a part of already existing archive. So because you are two actually first artists, I knew to work with archives. What, uh, mm, what with archives, are they like privatized? Uh, like who can access the information? And how does like people who are straight, who are not interested in queer, who are like not part of the so-called bubble, how do they access information? Or through your story, I kind of get the idea that art, like visual, in, uh, visual representation, is uh, much more effective of telling the story. And I wonder, like, can you like tell a bit about the difference when you have like photographs, documents, maybe in German language, and then you have like this universal, universal picture? How it different speaks to people, and like again, difference of media you can all work with, like paintings with like film, you work with quilts, like somebody might work with sculpture, like what's the difference between the all the mediums? Like how does that work? Yeah, this is like it's more than a lot one of question. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about a lot of things. We can also continue it after, uh, otherwise, also afterwards, if I don't answer all the questions now. But, um, <laughs> this was too many questions. <laughs> uh, we ha there are, so perhaps first about the forum. Um, so it was founded 1999. We have around 80 members, but perhaps like we have 20 members were really active. Uh, the other ones are more like supporting them. It's uh, partly pay, uh, like if you become a member, you have to pay a little um, membership um, fee, but like it's actually very little because we don't want to exclude also someone like for students or unemployed people. We have uh, very reduced prices as well because like there's such an issue around class in such a expensive and rich city as Munich as well, which also sometimes in thinking about queer history is also being forgotten. We know, for example, like the history of Paul Höcker because he was an academic painter before he was uh, um, fired from the Art Academy. And for so many people, um, with the, not this um, power of representations as well beforehand, um, we also don't know the history. So I think issues around classes is also actually very important as well in the archive. And I think also not enough addressed in the forum. But um, we do have opening hours three days a week. Um, um, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, um, and Thursday. But then in the pa past years, we did collaborate with a lot of different institutions in Munich, but also abroad. Um, for example, we had a show in the Haus der Kunst, which was called Archives in Residency. Um, but then also were very much involved in the in this exhibition to be seen queer lives in Ernestoku Centrum, which was especially important because it's in the Ernestoku um, 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 Centrum, which is the museum to remember like the fascist um, 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 time in Germany from 1933, but 1945. But the curators luckily really focused as well to not only um, narrate a story of like the violence, but also describe also like how big queer life existed before. And we gave certain materials, but also our research. The founder of the archive in Munich, he's, he's working, um, or one of the founders of the archive in Munich, Albert Knoll, he's working uh, um, also in the um, memory site of the concentration camp in Dachau and was the first historian in the 90s to um, focus like the queer victims in Dachau specifically, where there was no knowledge and remembrance till the end, uh, 90s, really about like the queer victims in Germany of the fascist movement. So like there's a lot of like, the, each member has actually like a certain interest and a certain experience. So like when students, act, luckily like a lot of students approaching us now, the email was will be sent like to the one with the biggest expertise on this topic, and then it's always like a very personal encounter how you're being introduced to the archive. So this is just like to understand a bit more, and then yeah. So most of our active twenty members, we have um, quite a lot of young uh, members now um, reached the last years, which I'm specifically happy. Uh, 
about because the um, yeah the continuity of the archive is being um, um, guaranteed a little bit through that because one idea is of like one question is already like what like we do grow bigger but then can all the done work done be be done voluntary or if there are certain limits as well of a self-organized archive do we want to become a state archive or a city archive or do we want to keep this independence there's a lot of different discussions around it but like we are ex um yeah everyone can reach us um we did a, we give a lot of guided tours through the city of munich as well or through the other cities to really see also like queer life differently in the city when you walk around that there are like traces which you might not know but they are there in the city as well and so yeah these are different ways of really like reaching out to different people yeah and then the can you say again the Perhaps like this is also like, for example, like with Albert, who is the researcher in the memory site of the concentration camp in Dachau. Whenever I publish a text, I can send, I often do, send him the text and it's like, is this correct, historically correct wrong? Because I do want, like I do take a certain different freedom as well, also like to tell the things differently, but like I still don't want to tell something wrong about like, how queer people were treated in national socialism. Um, so I think it's a very tricky question, like what freedoms you take and which you don't take. And I think like which every project and every, I think these topics I have to discuss again newly or something, but yeah. So that I, it's hard for me to give a general answer, but like for me it's really much more like, for example, like with the quilts, like to really make visible as well how difficult it is to approach this history. That's why very often the fabrics are reflecting or layering of very transparent fabrics which d create like this kind of more effect and you have to change position to see what is written on them. So it's really like, yeah, but like, I would never say like there should be only artistic research. I'm happy that there's also other research, but like I'm, I'm thinking about like how I can also deal differently with emotions as well in my works. I think like uh, emotions and affects, of course, like it, there's this very important book of mine, which was very much um, inspiring me in my beginning becoming a member of the archive. It's an archive of feeling, uh, feelings by Anne Kvetschkovic. And she's really describing like these powers of the self-organized archives, but also how emotions being particularly differently um, collected in self-organized archives and queer archives. And I think like this, and I don't mean affects in a way like I want to film someone crying or something. I don't want to repeat like this voyeuristic modes of representation, but like to think about affects with my work as well. I think like this is like in emotions, like this is, I think also an, different way to think about like what we can do as an artist in archives in general. Carol, do you want to add anything or <laughs> shall, shall we uh, no, continue I think in the private? No, I think everybody a bit tired. <laughs> Buy <laughs> drinks, we will be still here and then you can ask me. <laughs> okay. But I'm super happy that you stay with us and yeah, you can take a look at the magazine yet and yeah. Then I would thank you too again for the conversation. Thank you very much. And I can still mention that tomorrow the Open Studios will start at 5 p.m. So you're invited to come there. And at 7 p.m. we're opening the exhibition by Julia Chang uh, in Trackel House. And at 8 p.m. there is an artist talk there. And uh, from 9.30 on um, here, there is the music program again starting. So come, come tomorrow. <laughs>